Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out on perhaps yet another rainy night to be with us here for the first National Security College Public Seminar of the Year. Um, my name's David Connery. I'm the Deputy Director of Strategy and Development for the College, um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, I'm also very pleased to be able to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians for whose traditional lands that we meet upon and for the cultures that they have which are amongst the oldest in continuing human history. A little about the National Security College before we start. Uh, we've now been operating for a little over uh, 18 months and we conduct uh, a look, education for executives uh, of the national security community and we also conduct a postgraduate program uh, called Graduate Studies in National Security Policy. Other activities we do include a small but I'm pleased to say now becoming more and more active research program as well as outreach programs like this. And hopefully you would have come in contact through us through our website and I'd encourage you to keep looking at our website for what we're doing and the sorts of events that are coming up. I'm sure uh, you'll find many of them of interest. And I think tonight's uh, topic and the crowd that's drawn just shows what kind of interest there are in the broad range of national security challenges that not only Australia faces but our region faces. Um, just by watching events over the last uh, six months or so, you would have seen some significant disputes over leadership, legal proceedings, uh, an attempted coup. It's starting to sound a bit like home. Um, and uh, only today, the arrest of the Chief Justice of the High Court. Now, if you're a long-term PNG watcher, uh, you, might not be, uh, you might not be so startled. Um, but when news of our neighbours is conveying to many Australians uh, an impression of crisis, an unfolding crisis, it does start to get significant attention. So in the shadow of the PNG election, we thought this would be a really good topic to broach with three eminent speakers. The first of those speakers I'd like to introduce is Dr. Ron May. Ron comes, uh, is an emeritus fellow at the School of Society and Governance of Melanesia here at the ANU. He's previously held a number of senior academic portfolios here at ANU and is, in my view at least, uh, one of Australia's foremost experts on PNG politics and society. Ron will start the seminar tonight and he'll um, look at the current situation and how we got here. Following Ron, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Amory O'Keefe AM. Amory uh, is a uh, research fellow at the Lowy Institute where she's also working in their Melanesia program. She brings to us very senior experience in government as a Deputy Director General of AusAid, a Minister Councillor uh, to Port Moresby for AusAid, and also uh, a strong involvement in regional NGOs and charities, particularly those focusing on HIV and AIDS. We've asked Anne-Marie to examine the implications of current events and trends for the, PN, uh, for the future of PNG. And our third speaker tonight will be Mr. Sean Dorney. Now, Sean is described as a veteran ABC reporter, uh, and it's safe to say that his reporting on PNG has been very influential for a generation of Australians in helping us to understand that country. Um, Sean now has broader responsibilities as the, a as the ABC's Pacific correspondent, uh, but his long 35 year plus association with PNG has included uh, a few uh, trips back there as a posted foreign correspondent, as well as secondments uh, to the PNG National Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, Sean's also a Walkley Award winner and has published two books on PNG politics. I think you'll agree with me with that kind of background and, and all those kinds of backgrounds and this topic, we're in for quite a treat. Why we'd uh, like to do this is to kick off with uh, each speaker just briefly outlining for 15 minutes the key points um, of their particular topic and then I'd like to turn over to Q&A um, and Ash will be around with, uh, Ash and Debbie will be around with microphones so we can record it. I would point, of course, that we are uh, being recorded for our YouTube site, so I encourage you to tell your friends who couldn't make it um, that um, it'll be up there within a, within a week or so. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ron May to the microphone. Ron. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I've been asked to uh, give a little background on how we got to wherever it is we are at the moment uh, in 15 minutes. So we're going to skip the prehistory, the culture, the colonial period and cut straight to 2001. Up to 2001, uh, to 2001 and indeed beyond that, every government in Papua New Guinea has been a coalition. Elections 
have been contested by large numbers of candidates. In 2007, there were on average 25 candidates per electorate and the highest number of 69 in Oro province. Political parties were weak and often short-lived. Members of parliament frequently hopped from one party to another and parties shifted from coalition to coalition to seek political and often material advantage. Since 1977, no government had survived a full five-year parliamentary term, most being removed by votes of no confidence against the Prime Minister. Then in 2001, Parliament enacted an organic law on the integrity of political parties and candidates, uh, popularly referred to as by abbreviation OLIPAC, whose main objective was to promote political stability by strengthening political parties and preventing party hopping by MPs. In the national election of 2002, the National Alliance Party, led by Sir Michael Samari, won the largest number of seats, and Samari was invited to form a government. He was elected Prime Minister, heading a coalition of 13 parties. Although the more ambitious aims of the Oli Pact were not realised, with most parties splitting between 2003 and 2006 and coalition partners uh, regularly reshuffling, the Samari government of 2002 to 2007 became the first since 1977 to survive a full term in office. This was in part due to the provisions of Oli Pact, but also due to the Samari government's ruthless use of its majority to avoid votes of no confidence by adjourning parliament for long periods and manipulating parliamentary processes through a compliance speaker, of whom we'll hear more later, and the stacking of parliamentary committees. Notwithstanding growing complaints of executive dominance by parliament and pending misconduct charges against several ministers, the National Alliance again won the largest number of seats in the 2007 national election and Samari was re-elected as Prime Minister by 86 votes to 21, heading a coalition of initially 14 parties. The dominance of parliamentary proceedings by an inner circle of cabinet continued in the new party, when in 2009 the government adjourned parliament to avoid a vote of no confidence, a post courier editorial described the move as a shameless exercise in self-preservation and 11 members of the governing coalition defected to the opposition. The small opposition group contained some notable talent, including the former Prime Minister, uh, Sir Makiri Marauta, and the former Finance Minister, Bart Filliman, but was unable to exercise any significant influence in the parliament. Then in July 2010, the Supreme Court, responding to a challenge to the OLIPAC, ruled that key provisions of the organic law were unconstitutional. In particular, the provisions which restricted MPs from changing their allegiances within the parliament. This opened the way to a resumption of what Park New Guineans have referred to as yo-yo politics. Within days, a number of MPs, including the Deputy Prime Minister Pukatemu, crossed the floor and there was again talk of a vote of no confidence against Samari. The motion of no confidence was averted when in July the Speaker, Geoffrey Nape, adjourned Parliament for four months. Parliament reconvened in November, but attempts to revive the motion were frustrated when it was ruled out on technical grounds by a parliamentary committee, at which stage Parliament adjourned again. In March 2011, Samari appeared before a leadership tribunal, which he'd managed to avoid doing since 2008, and was subsequently suspended from office for two weeks for failing to meet reporting requirements of the leadership code. Shortly before this, Samari had replaced the Deputy Prime Minister, Don Pollier, by another Highlander MP, Sam Abal, and Abal became Acting Prime Minister. The removal of Pollier exacerbated growing tensions within the National Alliance. Then in, March 2000, in late March 2007, Samari left for medical treatment in Singapore. Following complications after initial surgery, he was still in Singapore in June, and speculation was growing as to whether he would return to Parliament. In late June, his son Arthur, the member for Angoram, announced that the family had decided he would retire, though Sir Michael had not been consulted at this stage. <laughs> Abal remained as acting Prime Minister. When Parliament met again <coughs> on the 2nd of August 2011, the Speaker, Nape, the erstwhile enforcer for the Samari government, accepted the opposition's declaration that the Prime Ministership was vacant, ignoring the legal requirements for such a declaration, 
And Peter O'Neill was voted in as Prime Minister by 70 votes for, to 24, with about half of Somari's National Alliance, including the former Deputy Prime Minister Pollier, crossing the floor. O'Neill had been leader of the opposition during the 2000 to, uh, 2002 to 2007 parliament, but had served as finance minister in the coalition government in 2010-2011. Belden Nama, a former National Alliance MP who had crossed the floor in 2010, became opposition leader in May 2011 and became deputy prime minister in the new uh, go uh, government, what we'll call it for the moment, that emerged in the uh, 2nd of August vote. Samari's supporters promptly challenged the legality of O'Neill's election in an appeal which went to the Supreme Court. O'Neill countered with several dubious actions, including an attempt to dismiss the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court for maladministration, an issue which, uh, as you will have gathered, is still quite current. The Chief Justice responded by having O'Neill and his Attorney General charged with contempt of court. They were taken to the police station but released on bail and that case is still pending. And having Parliament rescind the leave granted earlier to Samari for his absence in Singapore and pass legislation to retrospectively change the conditions under which an MP could be disqualified, thus depriving Samari but not only of the Prime Ministership but also of his East Sepik provincial seat. Samari turned to Port Moresby in September, claiming to be the only leg legitimate Prime Minister but was clearly outnumbered in Parliament. Then on the 12th of December, the Supreme Court handed down its decision in the appeal to the 2nd August events. In a majority judgment, it upheld the challenge, endorsing Samari's claim to be Prime Minister. After a brief hesitation, the Governor-General, Sir Michael Oggio, the man who in fact had sworn O'Neill in in August, <coughs> accepted Samari as Prime Minister and swore in his cabinet. But O'Neill did not accept the Supreme Court's ruling, uh, and he appointed Nape as Acting Governor-General until Ogier changed his position to favour O'Neill. For a while, Papua New Guinea thus had two Prime Ministers, two Governors-General, two National Executive Councils, and after Samari made a new appointment, two Police Commissioners. Samari subsequently appealed to the Papua New Guinea Defence Force Commander, a fellow CPIC appointed by Samari, to help enforce the Supreme Court decision but the, the commander declined to be involved in what he rightly saw as a civil matter. Remarkably, there's been very little civil unrest. A large section of the public seems to have welcomed or at least accepted the change. For a while, some businesses and offices closed and there were minor demonstrations in provincial centres. But there was no mass protest. There was no confrontation within the police force, which in recent past has been noted for its fractiousness. And after a short while, Samari's appointee as commissioner was integrated with his contingent back into the main force. In January, Samari attended a meeting of parliament but was told to leave and threatened with arrest. Since then, Samari and most of his supporters have boycotted the parliament, though one of his supporters, Dame Carol Kiddu, has taken her seat as leader of a small but reportedly growing opposition. In late January, the Samari camp appointed their own PNG EDF commander, Colonel Yarat Sasa, a former defence attaché to Indonesia who appears to have been retrenched. And with a group of about 30 soldiers, Sasa briefly took control of the Tarama and Murray barracks in Port Moresby, placing the commanding officer at Tarama and the PNG EDF commander, uh, General Agui, under house arrest and calling for the reinstatement of Samari as Prime Minister in accordance with the Supreme Court's ruling. But the takeover had collapsed by the end of the day and Sasa now faces charges of inciting a mutiny. Deputy Prime Minister and now newly appointed Acting Defence Minister, Belden Nama, who is himself a former PNGDF officer, announced an amnesty for the others involved in the mutiny, recalling his own experience of spending over six years for, in jail for his own part in the 1997 Sandline affair. The impasse thus remains. Samari may have the support of the Supreme Court, but O'Neill has the numbers in Parliament. The Supreme Court is due to rule next month on a further appeal, and last month O'Neill, the O'Neill Coalition made a second attempt to remove the Chief Justice, and as you've heard, uh, as of this morning, the Chief Justice was taken by armed police to Barocco Police Station this morning for inquiry, so I gather he has been released. So that, that issue continues. But whatever's decided in the court decision forthcoming, 
it's unlikely to change things. O'Neill and Marmer have made it quite clear that they are like, quite unimpressed by the Supreme Court's opinions, and in the meantime, the public service, as well as the police and the army, have fallen into line behind O'Neill. Because all this has happened in 12 months before a scheduled election, the option of a vote of no confidence has been effectively ruled out. A successful vote of no confidence at this stage would trigger a dissolution of Parliament, and since more than 50% of MPs have lost their seats in every election to date, and in 2002 almost 80%, few MPs want to face an electorate prematurely. In any case, much of the country has been in election mode for some time, and with writs being issued in April for an election in June, elections will soon be upon us. Unless, of course, the demands currently coming from the NAMA camp for a postponement of the election gain traction. Only with an election will the present impasse be broken. And at this stage, with MPs switching party allegiances and new parties springing up, it's impossible to predict who will emerge as the Prime Minister after the election. But even if there is a successful election in June, with a new government emerging through proper constitutional processes, the events set in train by Samari's opponents on 2nd of August have done serious damage to Papua New Guinea's democratic institutions. The initial route moves to get rid of Samari in August were clearly improper, even though some might have seen Nafe's role in this as a sort of poetic justice, and the attempts to block a judicial appeal, as well as the use of retrospective legislation to remove Samari from Parliament, can only be described as political fuggery. Even some of Samari's opponents have objected to the crude lack of respect accorded to the man widely referred to as the father of the nation. In seeking to dismiss the Chief Justice, whatever substance there may be in the charges against him, in the hopes of influencing the outcome of the Supreme Court's deliberations, and then choosing to ignore the Court's ruling, the O'Neill Lama coalition have seriously undermined the judiciary, which to date has been one of the most robust institutions in Papua New Guinea's democratic system. The idea that a parliamentary majority gives those in the legislature overriding powers to act as they like reflects dangerous misunderstandings of the nature of Westminster democracy. The concern that some of us now have is that the sort of political behaviour we've been watching since August, August uh, last year, and indeed the pattern of executive dominance which has become increasingly evident since 2002, might represent an emerging new style of political behaviour in which the legislature, the judiciary, and ultimately the rule of law become hostage to whichever group manages to get a majority in Parliament. If this is the case, it remains to be seen whether civil society and the media can continue, in Don Chip's words, to keep the bastards honest. Thanks, Ron. That last line leaves a bit of a ring. May I now introduce Anne-Marie O'Keefe. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, David. And it's a great pleasure to be here um, this evening to talk about a country that uh, has had... Uh, had uh, a great effect on me personally as well as professionally. And I suppose because of the years that uh, I've had some sort of professional association with, uh, with PNG, I, I, like David suggested, am one of those who actually don't see the current political standoff in PNG as a unique crisis with significant <laughs> ramifications for the future stability of the country. I'm not saying it doesn't have significant ramifications, but it's not unique, and therein lies the problem. It's simply a different expression of an enduring characteristic of PNG politics. The ability for the parliamentary process to be spectacularly rambunctious and to startle the neighbours, i.e. us. As we've heard from Ron, PNG's politics are highly competitive. The personal connections and the tribal loyalty dominates. Party affiliation comes a very poor second, probably last. There are several parties, but allegiances are definitely not strong. And to borrow Ron's expression, 
which he borrowed from Papua New Guineans, we see yo-yo politics all the time. Ron has given us a description of the circumstances since about 2001, but gosh, if you look before then, you will see similar sorts of issues. The 80s, Samari was voted out in 80, Samari was re-elected in 82, he was voted out in no confidence in 85, he was replaced by Pius Winty. Winty was defeated in a no confidence vote, replaced by Rabbi Namalau, and then the 90s arrived, and gosh, didn't we have fun in the 90s? Um, we had Pius was re-elected in 92, <coughs> Julius Chan was elected in PM, uh, elected PM in 94, but those of you who were around for the uh, Sandline crisis um, will we'll recall that he had to stand, line, stand aside because of that. Then we had Bill Skate in uh, 97, and then of course Bill Skate resigned as Prime Minister in 99 because of the allegations regarding the misappropriation of development funds. Um, then we had McCary Murata in 1999. He faced his own mutiny in 2001. And then in 2002, to bring it up to where Ron started, we had Samari, and the rest, as you know, is history. So, behind all, all these headlines too, there's significant periods of disruption to government business. So, the hand on the tiller of government is often not quite firm enough, never quite steady enough, never quite sure which direction it should be taking the government because too frequently it's diverted by power struggles. And the struggles in themselves may be peaceful enough in terms of the very limited personal injury, even property damage, but the real damage for now and for the future is being wreaked on the broader population as basic services are failing the bulk of the population. And I'm just going to go through some of the indicators which points out, point out I think really very well, better than my words can do, where the country's going from that development perspective, from the social development perspective. Let's see how we're going. All right, those of you, many of you will be familiar with the UN <coughs> Development Report, and um, unfortunately, PNG <coughs> continues to go down in the ranking. It was 137th in 2009, 2010. In 2011, the latest report, it's down to 153rd. PNG's literacy rate still ranks among the worst in developing countries at 60%, although there has been a slight increase of, since 2000 from 57%. But it's in the primary, um, it's in the primary school enrolments that we really see what's happening. And uh, according to the World Bank data, in 2000 it was 71% primary school enrolments. By 2006, it's down to 56.2%. Now, there is evidence, particularly anecdotal evidence, that PNG started to improve on that, but trying to get access to that firm data is very difficult and it's certainly not available through the World Bank. We look at health and it doesn't get any better. Um, here you'll see, this is um, um, the profile that the World Health Organization has put together, its most recent one, um, on PNG. And I want to draw your attention, if you can see it, it's the, middle, it's the middle chart, the per capita total expenditure in health. The circles you'll see is what um, the expenditure is across um, the Western Pacific region that WHO covers in this particular um, part. Of, uh, of the world, and you'll see that per capita expenditure across the region has, has risen really significantly in the 15 years since 1995. So it's, it's more than doubled. PNG has remained consistently low and persistently low through that entire period. They are the triangle that you see at the bottom of the chart and that's what they're spending on, on health. 
In terms of demographics, um, populations rising uh, rapidly, currently at 7 million, it will be 10.1 million in 2030. We often talk about the drift from rural to urban. In actual fact, that doesn't seem to be borne out in the statistics. Um, again, according to a number of the different UN and World Bank statistics that I could get hold of, um, we've always used the 15% as the urban population. It's not. It's actually down to 12.6%. And therein lies the problem. Because you have the bulk of the population in the rural and remote regions, and that's precisely where the basic services, health and education, are not reaching the people. You have the very um, real reality as demonstrated by PNG's um, tracking record for trying to reach the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. The vast majority of the poor in the Pacific live in PNG, around 2 million. But unfortunately, it is the only country in the Pacific that will not meet any of the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. And a number of those, those goals, for those of you who aren't familiar with the goals, um, cover things such as education, PNG's off track, um, gender equality, PNG, along with all other Melanesian countries, I might point out, except Fiji, is off track to achieve the gender equality goal. Um, PNG is off track in terms of reducing child m mortality, whereas all other um, Pacific Island countries are making some headway in that regard. It's off track in terms of reducing maternal mortality. It's off track in terms of combating malaria and tuberculosis, and the same can be said about its a progress towards environmental sustainability. Yet, the sad irony of this is that despite this very poor showing in terms of social development, in comparison to all the other Pacific Island countries, PNG is very strong, macro, in a very strong macroeconomic position. In 2011, according to the PNG Treasury, economic growth was around 9.5%, up from 7.1% in 2010. IMF projects that in 2012 it will be around 8%. And this will mark the 10th year where PNG has enjoyed uninterrupted economic growth, averaging around 4.4%. And aside from the income that it's receiving from its natural resources, both renewable and non-renewable, PNG has, for the most part, been the biggest recipient of Australian aid since its independence. So, this isn't a matter of money or resources. Indeed, the totality of all aid received by PNG in 2009 represents only 5.3% of PNG's gross national income. Australia always considers that its aid program is a little bit like the gorilla in the shop. I hate to tell you, it's not. It's actually quite a very small proportion of what PNG is actually receiving. So what we're seeing now is an extreme imbalance between income and social development outcomes. And the current situation, the current political situation, threatens to exacerbate a deeper and graver governance malaise. So as such, the real concern or challenges for the future is how the government, whoever it is, is or isn't fulfilling its social contract with the people of Papua New Guinea. Will the government implement the sort of development work which is essential to rehabilitate the infrastructure and upgrade the basic services with the income it's receiving from the mining projects? The plan's in place. Many of you will, will know about the medium term development plan for 2011, 2015. But is it going to be like so many of its budgets, paper budgets? It says it's going to spend X, but never does. This is the plan that actually has to be 
implemented, there has to be determination and focus if that plan is going to be turned into action and outcomes. Inaction brings with it a heavy cost. And aside from the domestic implication for Papua New Guineans, there are several potential strategic implications for Australia. For example, external forces are more able to manipulate self-serving political systems and capture the resources valuable for PNG's own department. This could be a foreign government, doesn't have to be. Can be a mining company. And we've seen it in recent weeks in terms of the, the desire of at least a couple of mining companies wanting the government to impose a state of emergency because it makes it easier for them to continue their operations. The other, the other way it can have important implications for Australia is that the continuing demise of basic services can and does result in transboundary problems for neighbours. And the current situation with Torres Strait and the provision of health services for Papua New Guineans for Western Province, because that province is unable to provide those services, services is a case in point. And the third, because I've got to wrap up, the third area is the threat of destabilisation in more remote parts of the country. Southern Highlands is an obvious example at the moment with the current arms build up in the lead up to the election as they feel increasingly distant from a government because it's invisible in the terms of the real deliverables to the people on the ground. So it's very unfortunate but in this particular case, it seems that what happens in Waigani, unfortunately, stays in Waigani. Thank you. Emery, thank you for that. Sometimes nothing speaks better than numbers. Can I ask for our final uh, speaker tonight, Sean Dorney? Just one point on what Anne-Marie has said. Those statistics that you've seen may go part way to explaining why there hasn't been any public reaction to the demise of Sir Michael Samari, who led the country for nine years. Uh, the other thing she mentioned was Bill Skate, and I'd forgotten <laughs> about Bill Skate, but there is one great line that Bill Skate gave to me. I don't know if you remember, but the ABC got hold of some tapes that uh, Bill Skate was boasting after having had a bottle of whiskey that uh, he was the godfather of all the rascal gangs. And at a press conference, uh, he pointed at me and said, Sheen, Sheen, you know what we like? You're married to a pub, you get in. We get pissed and we spoke bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Three weeks ago, on the eve of my going to Papua New Guinea to try and collect material for the ABC Australia Network Current Affairs Program, Newsline with Jim Middleton, my bosses in Melbourne bludgeoned me into establishing a Twitter account. <laughs> Peter Lewis, our former correspondent in Auckland and now executive producer of Landline, suggested my account name at Carrier Pigeon. <laughs> Pigeon spelt like the language, not the bird. I didn't want to become a Twitterer, arguing that it would distract me too much. I joined Facebook simply to see photos of my grandchildren. I've been deluged by requests from all sorts of people many of them Papua New Guineans wanting to be my friend. <laughs> but with Twitter, while I resisted, they insisted. Anyhow, at Carrier Pigeon started tweeting, and the almost immediate effect was that when I arrived in Port Moresby at 9.30 at night, having tweeted about my flight, I found someone had cancelled my Avis hire card. <laughs> the reason I went to Papua New Guinea 
I was there for 10 days, was at the request of Newsline's acting executive producer who mistakenly thought that for the benefit of the Australian network audience, I could make sense of the recent political events there. <laughs> Nobody can, I protested. <laughs> and I felt like bending for my own purposes that great quote from Sir Paul Hus Hasler, who wrote in his book on Papua New Guinea, after having been the minister in charge for 12 or 13 years, that anything to do with PNG was a task for Sisyphus. What I did manage to do while there was to get to see and interview a number of the key people involved in the recent political events. Peter O'Neill, Sir Michael Samari, Deputy Prime Minister Berlin Nama, the new opposition leader, Dame Carol Kiddu, the new Deputy Opposition Leader and former Acting Prime Minister Sam Abal, and the Australian High Commissioner Ian Kemish. So I thought I might run through a few of the things they told me, especially on whether they think Australia has a role to play in the current situation. And then I might speculate a little on what the implications might be for Australia. Let us start with Sir Michael Samari. I was a bit surprised at how well Sir Michael looked. I spoke to him during and after a news conference that his daughter Bertha had arranged to comment on an incident the previous day in WeWAC when CPIC people had surrounded a plane and refused to allow a policeman from Task Force Sweep to disembark because of rumours that they were there to arrest the leaders of the East Sepik Provincial Government. Sir Michael was in pretty good form and one of the newspapers described his demeanour that day, quite accurately, as jovial. I told Sir Michael that many of us had feared he was on death's door in Singapore. Yes, yes, it's a big operation, my friend. You know it. And then he laughed good-naturedly. But he's not so happy with Australia. After describing the O'Neill administration as the purported government, he barked, but the Australian government is supporting them. There has been criticism in the Samari camp that Australia has definitely taken sides in the dispute. And there's quite a bit of anger that Peter O'Neill was given such a warm and honoured reception in Canberra when he visited last November. Some of that is a bit unfair, seeing that at that stage the Supreme Court had not brought down its controversial 3-2 ruling, ruling that Samari should still be the Prime Minister. That came in December, of course, as we've heard. Sir Michael's relations with Australia have not been that good. He went to Singapore, not Australia, for his heart operations. There was the Brisbane Airport incident, when he was forced to take off his footwear at a security checkpoint, and the Julian Motti flight when the PNG Defence Force defied the PNG courts and thwarted Australia's attempt to extradite Motti by whisking him off to the Solomon Islands. Sir Michael also said that the WeWAC incident involving the police and politicians reminded him of when he was an activist student at the Admin College in Moresby. They brought in the special branch of the Australian police, he said. Special branch, here to do exactly the same. They did it in the 60s in my time when I was going to the Administrative Staff College and they did that. They followed us around, us activist students. I was one. We were talking about political parties and they did exactly the same. The police used to go around and get the good, they call them the good colonial boys, and ask them for a drink and talk and find out who'd you talk with? Are you talking to political leaders? This is a form of suppression, Samari said. And Nana and O'Neill are doing exactly that. They're Samari's words, of course, not mine. When I asked Peter O'Neill for a reaction to the criticism of Australia, not so much from a Samari's side, but from some people here in Australia who claimed Australia could have played an honest broker role in trying to resolve the impasse, he was quite blunt. Australia has no participation in the politics of Papua New Guinea, he said. Australia is an important partner in the development of our country, he went on. We respect that. But they also respect our independence, our sovereignty, our way of doing politics. He also made a comparison with Julia Gillard's government in Canberra. We don't have a majority of one, he said. I have a majority of close to 50. If anyone doubts that kind of mandate, all they have to do is come and visit the parliament. 
So we're in charge of the executive government, we're in charge of the public service, we're in charge of the treasury and the police force and the security forces of our country. And I think the Australian government and other international partners and partner countries around the world recognise that." End of quote. The Deputy Prime Minister, Belden Nama, has a very soft spot for Australia. In particular, he's a devotee of one of our major institutions here in Canberra, the Royal Military College Duntroon. Mr Nama is a former soldier. He was one of the key people involved in getting rid of the Sandline mercenaries back in 1997. Indeed, Belden was the one who held a military pistol to the head of Sandline's boss, Tim Spicer, when Spicer was pinned to the floor in the PNGDF commander's office and whispered in his ear, welcome to the land of the unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> Nama late, later spent two and a half years in the Bamana prison. He was actually sentenced to six, but after two and a half he was given a pardon. I could explain the case during questions later, but I won't do now because it would take too long, but he did write to me from prison and later he was given a full pardon. I'm not claiming any credit or <laughs> <laughs> the letter and the pardon weren't connected in any way. Just before our interview, I gave the now Deputy Prime Minister a copy of the Sandline Affair in which I detailed that scuffle on the floor that he had with Tim Spicer. Bellinama's opening answer to my first question revealed how much he had enjoyed being here in Canberra. My going to the Royal Military College in Duntroon, Deputy Prime Minister Nama said, has had a lot of impact on my life in terms of my leadership and the discipline that I have in me. He was quite effusive about Duntroon, saying it had produced some great leaders. Nama is a very interesting man and a very rich one. I asked him where all the money had come from. After giving me a stern look, perhaps thinking I had something to pull out from under the table, <laughs> he replied, Sean, I do logging business, timber business in my own land in Vonimo. I did that before I became a politician. Immediately when I got out of jail, I went back home, stayed with my village people and helped them develop some projects, build bridges and roads into areas that have never been serviced by governments. And today, Sean, if you go to my village, most of the infrastructure in terms of roads and the new school, <coughs> the bridges, these aren't logging bridges, Sean, they're permanent steel bridges. They've been built from funds I made from the projects that I am doing in logging on my own land in my own district. None of the other part New Guinean politicians I interviewed believe that Australia should have tried to play a larger role during the current political standoff. The new opposition leader, Dame Carol Kiddo, does have a lot of concerns about the way things have gone, and I'll come back to that in a little while. One comment that was made to me at one stage was that if there had been a visit by Kevin Rudd, remember him? He was the Foreign Minister <laughs> during much of this activity. If Australia's Foreign Minister had made a visit to play that honest broker role, I was told it could have made things a lot worse. One result would have been to elevate the standing of the Samari side and give the public the impression that Australia considered both sides to be equal, when the reality on the ground is that the O'Neill government is recognised by most institutions internally as the one in charge, and demonstrably this is so. I did seek out the Australian High Commissioner, Ian Kemish, who incidentally spent some of his childhood in Papua New Guinea. Mr Kemish agreed to an interview on the last morning that I was in Moresby and I asked him about the criticism that Australia could have done more. And this was his reply. Apart from asking ourselves what's the most effective thing we can do, we need as Australians, as outsiders here in Papua New Guinea, to ask ourselves questions like, is the action underway within Papua New Guinea's own constitution? And importantly, really importantly, are Papua New Guinea's own institutions dealing adequately with the problems? <coughs> Mr Kemish went on, I'd argue that while there have been some troubling developments over the last few months, these developments have also underlined some positive things about the capacity of certain key Papua New Guinean institutions, and I mean particularly the Defence Force and the Police, to manage themselves in a mature, responsible and non-political way. 
So I think, he went on, we need to keep looking at it as friends of P&G. We should never feel we're locked into one approach or another. That would be silly. But, the, but for the moment, that respectful, quiet, but quite engaged approach that we have had has been working well for us. I then asked Mr Chemish about whether a rudd visit would have worked. For an external party to intervene at a moment of crisis, he said, can have unintended consequences, so those sorts of things need to be thought about terribly carefully. What are the implications of what's going on for Australia? That was the question I was asked to answer, and so far I've avoided it. I think one of the worrying implications is that the rules of the game in PNG are getting stretched and stretched, and you do wonder when the breaking point might come. For example, years ago, the court set down the limits to the power of the police minister to direct the police commissioner to do things. This was a celebrated case when Philip Baraga was the police commissioner and Warren Dutton was the minister. When I was in PNG just a few weeks back, the police minister in the O'Neill government told a news conference I was at that he, as minister, had directed the commissioner to investigate some of his officers in the East Sepik province, including the provincial police commander, and to bring charges against them under the Police Act. When I questioned both O'Neill and Nama about the public impression they were using the police to carry out a vendetta against their political opponents, both denied it, claiming Operation Sweep was just a move against corruption. Not many in PNG believe that, and the pursuit of the Chief Justice is not a good look for the rule of law in any country. I'll just end off by quoting Dame Carol Kiddo. In her first question as opposition leader, she stated that in Papua New Guinea, they had developed what she called an executive dictatorship in its parliamentary democracy. And she stressed that she wasn't just talking about the O'Neill government. She said it was a disturbing trend that went back many years. She said she had parted company with Sir Michael after the attempted military mutiny in January, which had made her extremely uncomfortable. But she's also concerned at some of the laws that have been passed attempting to legitimise the O'Neill government. Quotes, I think it is critical for Papua New Guinea as a nation that the court issues are resolved and the le legal issues are resolved. There are some things that I hope are ruled as not legal. Some of the amendments and the retrospective amendments made to the Prime Minister's Act. I think they're very dangerous. They've set a very dangerous precedent for the politics of Papua New Guinea. Thank you. And thank you, Sean, and we'll just have to get the translation of Bill Skate's remarks from <laughs> Pigeon into English for a subtitle, perhaps. Now, can I um, invite you to, to think about now some questions that you might wish to ask the panel? Uh, please just raise your hand and I'll point you out. I'll try to point two or three in a row. There's number one. I'll try to point out two or three so we can get the microphones to you. And I'll ask our speakers to pass that one around and they'll just speak from their chair. So our first question. And if you could just identify yourself and your affiliation, that would be appreciated. And um, once you have the microphone. Mike Burke from the ANU. Um, could we ask each of the three speakers to uh, look in the crystal ball and answer the second phrase of the, uh, the uh, talk tonight? Where to from here? You too. <laughs> to the elections. Um, and that's going to be interesting. I asked uh, Sam Abal what he thought would happen in the elections and he thought that a record number of independents would be elected because he said the people were very confused about what had gone on. Um, 43 parties are standing or going to nominate candidates, we think. Um, so I, th I think a lot depends on the elections, but then I, the, my worry is that now that that organic law on political party integrity has, has been kicked out, that we're going to be back into the sorts of period we had um, before 2002, where there are just constant votes of no confidence and the whole attention of the parliament is taken up with trying to get in or get out. I, I 
wanted, I don't want to say what I think might happen in the elections because, you know, we all know that it's it's really difficult to to forecast. But I guess just just looking at the past and maybe using that as a bit of a guide for the future, um, PNG has continued to actually surprise us by never fulfilling our very negative forecasts. Constantly, we think this is it, it's going over, and it doesn't. Maybe this will be the time it goes over, but you know, having lived through the Sandline era where we thought, gosh, this is it, you know, there's, there's countless numbers of times when we thought it was gonna go over. But you see, I think the tragedy is that it, it may not go over and it will just continue to totter on because of the resilience of the ordinary Papua New Guinean. But it's not fair on them that they're actually not benefiting from, from what could be a terrifically fabulous country. Yeah, well, looking beyond the election, I mean, I think one of the things we've got to take into account too is that we've got this LNG project going on which is projected to double GDP within a few years. Uh, politicians are projecting their 2050 vision. There's huge expectations about the large sums of money that are going to come in. The present government is partly uh, courting votes, but maybe even believes that it can provide free education, free medical services, and obviously reverse all the trends that Anne-Marie's been talking about. Uh, Anne-Marie started off by saying, uh, it's a line I often take at the start too, we've seen all these crises emerge before and everybody jumps up and down and says, oh, there's a coup in Papua New Guinea, there's a crisis here, and in due, in due course it blows over fairly amicably and the country goes on. And I think the country has a great capacity for doing that and, and that's going to be part of the future picture. But I also worry, as, as I think Sean does, that the rules are getting increasingly stretched and with more money floating around, increasing cynicism, indicators trending downwards continuously, there must be a tendency there for things to just get more miserable for most of the people in remote areas and for the, a lot of the people in towns. That may not produce dramatic tensions. Uh, we may not see riots or coups or anything, but, but the future does not look all that good, despite the large amount of money that's being generated. Thank you for those, uh, for those insights. Any up the back, second? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, David Sutcliffe from uh, Defence Intelligence and also College Alumni. Um, I was going to actually ask a question about the civil unrest and whether that could actually turn into something that might present a refugee crisis on our doorstep. By the sounds of it, they can't get organised enough for that. Um, my question is actually more for um, Dr O'Keefe and the health um, status that they've got at the moment and the declining quality of health care. Um, do you see PNG as being potentially a pandemic in incubator? Well, you know, it already has a, it has a pandemic on its hands already. Thank you. I've got my technical um, expert here. Um, it already has a, a pandemic on its hands and that's HIV and AIDS. And uh, that's, that's a, a, um, a communicable disease that has actually been driven by some of the less desirable social conditions in Papua New Guinea. It's, uh, it's heterosexually driven, unlike the HIV epidemic in Australia. A lot of it um, driven by the sexual violence. And I think you know we need to to recognise the position of women in PNG is one of uh, of great difficulty right across the country. The the domestic and sexual violence is is quite extensive, and the ramification of this is the um, is a pandemic called HIV and AIDS. In terms of other potential pandemics, whether it's uh, some, some flu type virus, etc. I think one of the benefits for PNG is because it has so many people in remote and rural parts that it is a little protected from some of those um, virus based pandemics that, that usually um, benefit from big urban settings, it doesn't. But we saw last year and the year before and the year before that problems with cholera as well, which is a direct 
um, result of the, the way in which the water resources are, are managed. So it, it varies, it varies enormously. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Lee. I was a legal advisor to the Constitutional Planning Committee, 1972 to 74. The committee came up with proposals for the Constitution, which was, with many amendments, eventually adopted in 75. Um, the Supreme Court has done pretty well, it seems to me, over the years since independence in, in upholding the principles and the terms of the Constitution uh, through very difficult times. In this particular case, I wanted to ask first, uh, perhaps Ron and Sean, uh, why, why they think it is that Samari did not go back to the Supreme Court straight after the uh, after the O'Neill put through the retrospective legislation to get the Supreme Court to knock that out, as probably they would have done, uh, while well, you just left the situation to swing and, and the numbers become stronger and stronger. And secondly, whether um, they see the Supreme Court's bulwark role in relation to the upholding of the Constitution and the fundamentals of the of the political situation in PNG, whether, whether they think it may be able to continue with that role. Perhaps we'll start with Ron on, on the first question. Okay, I'll first go that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of, the, there's no good explanation, I think, John, why Samari didn't come back. I, mean, I think a number of us felt that he should have reacted fairly quickly. But it was in the context of legal challenges going every which way. Um, you know, I, I didn't fill all this in in 15 minutes, but as soon as the, uh, the, the, the December decision came down, ECB provincial government issued a challenge. The next day, the Minister for Finance cut off all financial powers to the ECB government. The next day it was pointed out he didn't have the power to do that, so they were restored. And event after event went on like this. Um, the Papua New Guinea system has become very legalistic. Uh, and a lot of lawyers are behind every one of these politicians. Sean was just mentioning this earlier. Uh, they, there are lots of lawyers hanging around. They've all got a different opinion. I thought the decision of the Supreme Court on the 12th of December was, was probably a pretty clear issue. I mean, the, the Prime Ministership had been declared vacant without any reference to the constitutional provisions that cover this. And yet the decision was a majority decision of three justices to two, and various people are telling me that if the appeal goes ahead again, it's quite possible it could be reversed. So I think what we're facing is an in a very legalistic system now uh, where lawyers have a range of different opinions. And I must say, in the case of the Olipak decision, I can't even see, as a non-lawyer <coughs> reading the judgments, how they came to a lot of those decisions. Uh, so I don't think there's any clear answer to this. On the second question of, of the future role, I think the judiciary is still one of the stronger bastions of, of Papua New Guinea's political system. But as I said, I think these events over the last 12 months or so have seriously undermined the position of the court. And if the charges go ahead um, against the Chief Justice, some of, some of my legal uh, colleagues tell me there's a quite good prospect that, that, that he will be found guilty of some, some of these uh, charges, and that will undermine the court further. And, uh, to, to re recover a situation in that stage will not be easy. Uh, yeah, I was in uh, the court um, during one of these appearances and uh, they just had to keep moving tables into the court to accommodate all the lawyers. Um, there were nine separate parties wanted to be joined to this current action. There were something like 13, 12 or 13 separate cases, there, there are two that they're, they're looking at and there are nine people trying to be joined to that and each has about three lawyers. Um, you know, it's an absolute field day for the lawyers now and, and um, Paul Barker, who's with the Institute of National Affairs in PNG, was saying that one of the problems is that the Constitution doesn't set out um, an answer for every possible eventuality and, and neither should it. But that's one of the reasons everyone's so confused. I, I, I just wonder about the role of the Chief Justice because 
um, they've been pursuing him for quite some time. It was a 3-2 decision and he went with the two who decided to go with Samari. Uh, the current case that's on, two of the three judges are the, the two that went for O'Neill in that judgment. So I don't think the, 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 court, the case was all that clear cut and you know, that decision has caused a lot of mayhem. Mm. Well, thank you for that question and the next one. My name is Paul Kama and I'm from the uh, University of Canberra. I'm studying law. Um, my question is, I think um, the issue before the court now and it's still pending is who is the legitimate government? And the court, the court said um, uh, uh, Somali, but then the parliament come up with that uh, legislation which they, they said it's a bit of real. Well, I guess Sen and uh, Ron, has, Ron has a, a, a touch on that. With that case uh, currently uh, before the court, where, where, where Dr. Marat has uh, brought, brought forward, if the court decided that Somalia government is the, is the uh, legitimate, what would be the uh, implications? Oh. Anne Marie, would you like to start on that one? You know, um, it's March and uh, the writs should be announced in April. I used to be a, a bureaucrat here in Canberra and um, one of the things I learned to do when I had to face the Senate estimates was talk. And uh, that stopped questions from being asked. And I have to say, that's probably the best thing that could happen in PNG at the moment, to let the court process proceed until it's time for the people to actually make the decision. Yeah, outside the court uh, that one day, I did go there, one of the lawyers told me that um, their side's tactic was to try and delay things as much as possible, but they couldn't understand why it seemed to also be the tactic of, of the other side. <laughs> 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 and, and the judges actually got quite annoyed. The three judges got quite annoyed with the lawyers saying, you know, we shouldn't be here to act as your nannies. You guys should all sort this out and we should be prepared to go ahead now. But the eventual thing was another delay, another week's delay. Then they've now set a possible time, but they've got so many lawyers appearing before them, I think it's going to drag on and I think the election will come and overtake it. Thank you. And question up here first and then down to Rosemary. Thank you. Um, my name is Jacinta Manavan from the Papua New Guinea High Commission. Um, Shani mentioned about Twitter and Facebook and all that. Hello. Just want to pose a question here. In terms of uh, your assessment, how can you, um, in terms of communication playing a role in educating the public about the issues uh, in the last couple of months? Because I think uh, really media has actually played a lot of role here in ensuring that uh, public is aware of all issues on the side that's um, side of O'Neill Nama government and also uh, the Samara led uh, faction of the government. So I just want to hear your comments or your assessment on the media. Oh, look, I was Thank told you. while I was there that um, Facebook and Twitter had played a terrific role in ensuring that there wasn't trouble because a lot of people were finding out very quickly what was going on. In fact, Liam Fox, our um, uh, correspondent up there, is, uh, is an inveterate Twitterer and uh, he's got thousands of followers and, you know, lots of Papua New Guineans and, and Facebook has really taken off up there. And, uh, huge numbers of Papua New Guineans, you know, in, in those who have access to electricity and computers. Um, you know, the social media, I think, is playing a, a really significant role there and, and quite a positive one. Anne-Marie? 
Yeah, I just want to um, strongly agree with with that, and also point out the role of uh, of mobile phones. I mean, PNG is actually going through a revolution in terms of telecommunications, and this is changing the framework. It's it's changing the way in which. Ordinary people can actually communicate with each other without having to rely on a government infrastructure. Uh, whether it's through Facebook, whether it's just through mobile phones, there is access now to mobile telephony even in the most remote parts of PNG. How this is going to play out, not just with this election, but in the future in terms of people increasingly being able to demand the rights and the services that they should get, I think it makes it a very interesting case to watch. Let me just add one, one brief thing to that. Uh, as you may have noticed, uh, there's been a recent statement from the Prime Minister's um, office, the media office, uh, saying that the government is closely monitoring uh, emails and blog sites uh, and that people issuing subversive statements will be dealt with. Uh, now, that, that's one of the th sorts of factors that causes some people like me to say, hey, just a minute, you know, we've always said, yeah, yeah, these crises blow over, but the, the, the rules are being stretched here in ways. Let me just tell you one other quick thing. When uh, I'd, I'd been away for a while when, uh, the, when O'Neill was elected, and I came back and Radio Australia rang me and they said, uh, can you make a comment on what happened in Palm New Guinea today? And I said, what happened in Palm New Guinea today? And they said, we've got a new Prime Minister. And I said, oh, who? And they said, somebody called Peter O'Neill. Do you know much about him? And I said, well, I know a bit about him, and uh, perhaps I won't comment on the ABC today. Um, <laughs> But I did go back and think, I'd better sort of fill in some of the gaps I've got in my knowledge of Peter O'Neill, and I went to Google, and the first three things that came up were relating to allegations, of very strong allegations, of corruption um, of O'Neill in, in earlier in his career. And my initial reaction was the people, the international journalists and people who go to Google to find out who this Peter O'Neill character is are going to hit a whole range of blog sites that say he's a crook and a thief. Uh, so there's, the role of the media is very significant in this. I can see why the present government would like to have a bit more control over yeah. it. And, and rip a charge from uh, Sean. The, um, the person who, who authored that uh, warning to the social media people was Ben Micah, who is uh, the chief of staff um, of Peter O'Neill. Ben Micah used to be a politician, and when he was a politician, he was um, very, very keen on introducing legislation to control the media, but never quite made it. Now, this is going to be geographically difficult for you, Rosemary. My name is Rosemary Ganley, and I've, I represent the United Services Institute here tonight. As well as being a defence tragic, I'm a crime tragic as well. And one of the things about crime is follow the money. If the GDP is so amazing and if the income is growing, one assumes the tax revenue is growing at an equal rate. Perhaps Anne-Marie and Ron can tell me where does the money go? Does it sit in the Reserve Bank or is it being filtered away somehow? Um. <coughs> In terms of the income, I mean, there has been quite a bit of work between the Australian government and PNG government to find ways in which sovereignty funds, for example, could be established to ensure that uh, the income that the government is receiving from, um, from the, the, the resources is actually being um, squirreled away in a good way so that uh, the resources will be, the financial resources will be available at a time when um, the um, the, the global prices are, are not as good as they are today. So there's, there's, there's that is the good, the good news, and and also the IMF in its recent um, Article Four uh, statement was was quite complimentary on the way in which uh, PNG's Treasury was was 
implementing a fairly independent and responsible approach to the management of the resources. I guess the issue is how the current resources are actually being spent and I referred to before the, the paper budgets. And I think we have to remember that in PNG it's not just national government that's responsible for um, the disbursement of resources and services. It's very much the provincial governments as well and therein lies yet another problem because you have very limited capacity in a large number of those provincial governments and you have limited resources and often even where you do have the resources they're just not getting spent. Well, I'll just add one, one thing though, briefly. The, the big expansion that's coming from LNG, um, the project actually starts generating revenue in 2014 and the, the revenue comes into the national coffers in 2018. So already the money is not there, but a lot of it's been spent already. Mm -hmm. And what we've had is a large number of people as part of the agreement with the LNG, the landowner the agreements with landowners owners under uh, memorandum of agreement for infrastructure development grants as their compensation for this. Uh, I was working for a little while with planning uh, two years ago and planning was actually trying to keep track of what agreements had been made with whom and they just couldn't do it because agreements had been made by planning, by people in finance, by people in petroleum and energy, by individual politicians and by God knows who else and the, uh, the landowner groups that had been registered were competing against one another. Out there are lots of people, this has been in the papers in, in Moresby just recently, are lots of people who say, who come into Moresby to one of these departments and say, the minister came through a while ago and promised me four million kina. And somebody tries to say to them, no, no, he promised you an infrastructure development grant for four million kina, and if you can put up a proposal, give it to planning, and then it'll go to finance for approval, and then the money will come out to be spent on that project. And people just, their answer to that is, you're stealing the money, you're keeping it in the department. There is a potential time bomb involved in the unrest uh, that's being generated in amongst landowner groups who can see the prospect of large sums of money but don't see the services getting delivered. Now these questions have been great but I think we've only got time for one more just in a second. Thank you. Lindy Schaefer, Graduate School of Strategy and Defence alumni. Uh, Anne-Marie, you talked about the tottering on and the instability as leaving open opportunities to outsiders. I was just wondering whether you could comment on Chinese government involvement in PNG. Uh, look, I, ha I can't uh, give you any evidence of overt or even covert um, Chinese government influence in, in PNG. I think where the influence that that uh, China is playing is through its economic activities in PNG, and uh, it uh, it's it's actually got quite a breadth of economic involvement. Although Australia still stands as the the most important uh, economic partner with PNG, and in fact uh, Australia is number one, followed by Japan, and China is still number three. But of course um, that may change in years to come in terms of uh, the trade with, with its uh, non-renewable resources. And uh, the, the the relationship between Australia and PNG has has often been fraught with difficulties because of because of the historical baggage that that we both share, and uh, there have been times when governments in PNG have we all remember the the look north policy and uh, the the concerns that that caused in Canberra about the way in which that might actually be um, be fulfilled. So you've always got that, but what I'm trying to say here is that when you have this self-serving political system, it just makes it easier for those countries, and not necessarily China, there, there can be other countries as well, Malaysia is one that, that comes to mind, um, South Korea is another one that comes to mind, that can actually um, perhaps use its influence in a way that may not be in Australia's interest as well. We all live in the same neighbourhood and that's, that's what we have to remember. I might Sorry. just add that the Chinese um, are finding developing Ramu, the nickel mine there, um, 
a real challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, ladies and gentlemen, we'll call our seminar um, this evening to a close.